Okay, I think we're ready to get started here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stamps.com's uh, webinar on email marketing for small business owners. My name is Eric Nash, uh, and I'm the Director of Online Marketing here at Stamps.com. Today's topic is Instant ROI, using email marketing to stay in touch and drive more business. As I'm sure many of you know and have experienced, uh, email marketing is a great communication tool to connect with your customers. Uh, email campaigns can be set up and sent out in hours, and email is very cheap compared to other direct marketing channels. Uh, email also provides you with great customer targeting capabilities and provides a lot of data points to measure success, such as email opens, lead generation, or even sales. Um, and, and learning all the ins and outs of email can be complex if you're a small business owner who wears a lot of different hats, and uh, as many of us do. And if you haven't done a lot of email marketing for your business yet, it, it definitely can see com seem complex. Um, understanding things like whitelisting, getting your emails delivered into the inbox is always a never-ending battle. And even for the most uh, experienced marketers, they still encounter those same problems, for whether you're brand new to email or experienced. To teach us some tips and tricks today, we're really excited to have Dave Walters, product evangelist from our email partner, Silverpop. Silverpop is a leader in marketing automation and email marketing software, and they power all of Stamps.com's customer email delivery. Dave has been in the digital marketing space for 20 years, working with Fortune 50 companies and top five interactive agencies. As a product evangelist, Dave works hands-on with Silverpop customers to sharpen their email marketing strategies and create technology solutions that solve business problems, which is always good. He has a ton of great advice for us and, uh, and some real-life case studies to share with us today. So we're really excited to have Dave. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, before we hand over the controls to Dave, I wanted to cover some quick housekeeping items. After the presentation, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in the question box. Um, you can. Also type those throughout the presentation. We'll be looking at those throughout the presentation and crafting all of our questions for the, uh, for the Q&A period. Um, also, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent out in a follow-up email. We'll be also uh, posting this webinar in, on our stamps.com YouTube page. Uh, lastly, if you're having audio problems and you're using your computer, we suggest using the call-in number on your invite email. And if you're having uh, audio problems on the phone, you may want to hang up and try calling in again. OK, before we get started here, I wanted to run a quick poll to find out how many of you are currently using email. So I'm going to launch it right now. You should see it here. Uh, looks like a lot of you, some good results are coming in. Options are if you're using Outlook to send email, if you're using a, a hosted program on your uh, internal server, if you're using an email service provider like Silverpop, or uh, many of you may not be using email at all yet, and, and today could be a good uh, method to, to find out some good info. All right, looks like we're pretty much done here. I'm going to close the poll, and uh, I'll share with you the results. Let's see here. So you should see the results there. Looks like uh, a lot of people are are using Outlook, and so a lot of people are not using email marketing yet. So it's uh, we should have some great information, and uh, and really looking forward to hearing Dave speak. So with that, I'm going to hand over the controls over to Dave. Dave, you should have the controls. Great, thanks, Eric. Whoops. Make sure I can get to our agenda slide here. You working? Show me the agenda slide. Uh -huh. You may need to click into the into PowerPoint away from the. There we go. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Looks good. All right. Great. Well, thanks, Eric. Um, great to join everybody today. And uh, I thought that poll was great. And wanted to start by just thanking everybody. Uh, for doing the pre-registration poll as well. So 
really gives me a sense of, of where folks are so that I can make this the most relevant talk for uh, the folks on the line today. Um, as Eric said, we'll field questions at the end. I'll keep an eye uh, on the queue of questions and sort of try to manage enough time at the end so that we can cover the majority of them. Um, not going to talk too much about us as a vendor today. I'll, I'll give you some sense of what we do and some of the businesses we do it for. Uh, but the primarily the goal of today is to show everyone a, a set of campaigns and a bunch of creative things that our existing customers do today, including stamps.com, uh, and how they use email marketing to drive their business. So we'll talk a little bit about Silverpop. Uh, we'll ask the question about why you use an email service provider. I see a fair amount of folks here are, are using Outlook. I want to just make sure we kind of all level set on, uh, on some of the reasons that commercial or marketing email should uh, should probably not come in, in large amounts out of your own outlook. So we'll talk a little bit about the rules of the road, both from a, a legal and, and an ROI perspective. And then we'll jump right into some customer examples, and then we'll finish up at the end with questions. So the question, who is Silverpop? Um, you know, Eric, I think, talked a, a bit about my background. Um, I've actually, for the 20 years I've been in digital marketing, I was, uh, I guess, going back to about 1999, I was actually Silverpop's first corporate customer ever uh, when I was inside UPS. So I worked internally at UPS and was on an interactive team that was chartered with uh, figuring out what email communications meant. And specifically, uh, in our world, it was around labor relations. So we had no way to kind of reach out directly to our customers but we had a large list of those customers. <clears throat> so we developed that, uh, that program from the ground up. So I've got a kind of a long history with Silver Pop, both as a customer and, and now as uh, someone who works here. In the, uh, in the email space, so Silver Pop really is kind of the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, digital marketing platform. So we do a lot of different things. Uh, we do email delivery, which is kind of our history. So originally, when I was first a Silver Pop customer, uh, it was enterprise level email delivery. Over the years, uh, the functionality has been layered in uh, to provide our marketing automation. And we'll talk a little bit of marketing automation is a big term, but we'll talk about what that means in terms of programs. So we'll talk about a happy birthday uh, campaign later in. Uh, in the presentation, which is in essence just a program that is a part of a marketing automation solution. And then we have uh, another company that we bought about a year and a half ago that does a lot of location-based marketing. So uh, if you're familiar with Foursquare or Facebook Places, so we'll talk a little bit at the end of the presentation uh, about uh, what location-based marketing could and should mean to your small business. And we'll give everybody uh, a kind of set of to-dos that you can go out and do today for free that will get your toe kind of in the water in location-based marketing. Uh, Silverpop as a, as a service is generally used by marketing groups. Uh, so in some cases, uh, those groups are groups of one, and in some cases, uh, they're groups of, you know, three or four or five hundred people. Um, we tend to be very much in the marketplace of people who want to do email marketing for themselves. So we actually have uh, be very, you probably would be very surprised how much a small group inside a mid-sized company uh, models exactly like a small business owner in the sense that you know there are one or two people performing the function. Their main goals are to deliver the email to do the kind of cross-sell and upsell of products, to generate the reporting, and at the end of the day, generate results. So we see a ton of folks, even people in my uh, showcase customer program, uh, I'll show you a logo in a minute from the Georgia Tech Alumni Association. Uh, they essentially run about 25 campaigns a month with one person. So this absolutely kind of can be done by a small set of people and provide great business value. It's literally just a matter of figuring out how to scale it and how to meet the needs for your specific business. 
So uh, I would guess that of, uh, of the folks who are using an email service provider, that 20% in that initial poll, uh, the majority of those folks are probably using someone like a Constant Contact or a MailChimp. Uh, there are a lot of great vendors, and, and I hope you take away from today's talk, there are a lot of great vendors for you to get started with in the guise of figuring out email and what it means to your business. So Constant Contact and MailChimp are two companies that uh, have a free offering, and then they have a little bit advanced offering. That, uh, that steps into the you know, sub $100 a month uh, type price point. If you figure out that business, uh, that email really does that make that significant of a difference to your business, then a lot of folks are coming directly into a, a tool like ours, which is in the hundreds of dollars per month, and then uh, it allows you to grow literally through the enterprise size. So I'll show everybody this list of, um, about you know over 4,000 brands that are powered by Silverpop, and you'll see some really big names here. Uh, I, again, I, I say the same thing, and, and down there under education, you see the Georgia Tech Alumni Association in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, the key point here really is a lot of these folks are very entrepreneurial, very small business type groups inside of companies. So think about the marketing group, you know, inside the Girl Scouts. So they don't have, clearly, that organization doesn't have 100 people doing digital marketing. They've got a very clear set of goals, and they're executing emails in a way that meet their business. The interesting thing about Silverpop compared to a lot of the other vendors in our specific space is I talked about growing the email channel with your business. Uh, we are a hands-on, so we're what's called software as a service or a SaaS service. So you log into our system and you manage everything in a portal on the internet. So there's no installing things in your enterprise. There's, uh, unless you want to get really complex, there's nothing really to do in your world uh, of technology other than to log into our system. So we are a very hands-on by the marketers themselves tool and that's a little bit different, and that allows us to really have a solid approach for you know small and medium business, and then be able to grow through functionally as uh, as those group gets even larger, and as businesses get more and more successful. So we talked about being scaled for small and medium business. Um, of those 4,000 plus brands, there are about 15,000 marketers who log into SilverPop every single day. Um, our product from a usability standpoint is an incredibly layered experience. So if all you wanted to do was use a standard template to send out a monthly newsletter and then look at the reporting on that newsletter, uh, that works perfectly fine and you can kind of stay in that uh, shallow water until you get to the point where you begin to ask yourself uh, deeper questions. And we'll talk about some of those deeper questions as we get through to the specific examples. But uh, we really focus on a, a tool that is very deep but doesn't require you to understand every bit of that depth in order to do something simple. Um, and most of our, as I said, most of our customers are relatively small groups who are looking to really force multiply uh, their customer communications. So they understand that reaching a customer with a, with a monthly newsletter uh, describing a special or doing something, uh, sending them a, a thank you email upon a major purchase. They understand over time that those things increase their business. And there really is, when you get to a certain point of wanting to reach 10 or 15 or 20 customers, or just you have to have some type of automated solution to do that. And we do actually have, I mentioned some, a little bit general pricing earlier. Uh, we traditionally have been a very large brand uh, that sold to large brands. So we see a very much of a developing market, uh, like I said, of folks who are coming from a constant contact with MailChimp. So we have a product now called Silver Pop Essentials, which is designed specifically for uh, folks who are in the small to medium business like the uh, majority of folks who are attending today. So let's, uh, let's talk for a minute about why you use an email service provider. Uh, 
when we talk about email service providers and marketing messages, what we're really talking about is, is content that you as a small business owner are sending to your customers in an effort to solicit uh, purchases from them or do something of a commercial nature. So it's absolutely fine if you as a small business owner want to uh, send an email thanking somebody for a purchase or email them a receipt, which is a transactional type of relationship. <clears throat> the minute you kind of step into asking someone for a sale, then you start to come into the can spam space. And I'm sure most folks have uh, heard a bit about the can spam regulations, but in general, they require you to offer your customers an opt-out, which is typically kind of difficult to do. Uh, well, not kind of difficult. It's virtually impossible to do if you're sending from your own uh, email. Uh, you need to provide a physical mailing address, and there are certain kind of legal restrictions around physical mailing addresses and all these other things that need to be part of that message uh, to keep it in compliance with can spam. So we find that a lot of folks, uh, the minute you kind of get to the point where it's, you know, you're, if you're thinking about sending out a blast message to people and you're blind copying multiple people so that they don't kind of see the whole list of people you're sending it to, it's probably time to evaluate a, uh, an early stage email service provider and look at the functionality that they have to offer. Uh, one of the biggest reasons, and Eric touched on it a little bit, is um, when you talk about deliverability, so there are uh, one of the driving reasons for people to use an email service provider is in doing that, we as, uh, as an email service provider have a set of tools, and Silverpop specifically has uh, 20 or 25 people whose only job it is is to ensure deliverability and accurate uh, delivery of your messages into the major domains. So Gmail and Hotmail and AOL, there are a series of these very public domains that, uh, that can be very specific about what does and doesn't get through and who it comes from and the reputation score of the, of the server that sends it. It can be a very complex thing. And at the end of the day, if your message that you send to you know, 500 people, let's say you have a, a large customer list, you send to 500 people, if 200 of those don't ever make it to someone's inbox or end up in their junk mail, then you're, you're really kind of cutting off your, your good value for people to respond to that. So making sure that you, that message comes from a, a reliable place and is delivered with a very, very high degree of certainty into the user's inbox is one of the major reasons that, that small businesses step into the email service provider tier. It also helps a, a business understand and quantify the results of an email program. So, you know, all of us can send an email and not be quite sure what happens to that email after it leaves our, our sent mail. So what we allow is tracking of each one of those messages. So if you send that message back out to those 500 people, you'll be able to see the number of people who have opened it, the number of people who have clicked on it, uh, the number of people who have opted out, and a whole series of other uh, results and reports around that specific mailing campaign. Um, you can also understand what someone individually does with multiple campaigns over time. So you're now for the minute you step into this world, you have a lot tighter kind of view of the interaction between your marketing message and your customers. So you can start to see uh, a lot of folks will do things with promotional codes. So then you could send a promotional code and understand that you sent it to 500 people, 250 opened it, and 20 redeemed it, and you know from those 20 people you drove $1,050 in revenue. So you can begin to quantify the effort that you're spending in your email campaigns if you've got these basic reporting and tracking tools. So for all of those reasons and, and a few legal kind of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt reasons, uh, your Gmail or Outlook is 
probably the, not the right place to be asking your customers uh, to have a commercial relationship with you. So let's talk a little bit about the marketing spectrum. Uh, I think based on all the polls and everything I've heard from folks, uh, I think most of the audience today is probably somewhere in the mass marketing to direct marketing part of this world. Um, we candidly have customers of all sizes in every one of these buckets. So we have uh, very large e-commerce retailers who understand that whenever they send even to their list of 700,000 people, they understand every time they send the same message out to everyone that it will produce you know, $4,000 in revenue every time they send it just because a certain number of people will buy. So we have very large retailer brands who are full, full on kind of mass marketers. Um, the next step up from mass marketing is a more direct marketing approach. So it starts to factor for things like what type of industry you're in, uh, what level of customer you might be related to my business, whether you're a you know, high volume customer or a brand new customer. So there's a degree of difficulty there beyond the mass marketing that says, okay, I'm going to now treat this a little bit differently, not radically differently. I might make a different offer to a new person versus someone I know has, has spent a lot of money on my site over time or is a really great customer in my brick and mortar store. The kind of top of the tier and, and where we see kind of the biggest brands going and you know this is something that I'll, I'll share with everybody so you can kind of keep in mind that the nice thing if you're going to select a tool to, to be your email service provider you want to think about, it. you'll ask questions of the technology and the channel based on what you want to do. And the zenith of what you want to do is uh, to adequately kind of interact and react to what your customers are doing. So when we talk about behavioral marketing, we talk about a set of programs that run all the time kind of in the background and wait for a series of things to occur and then when those things occur it literally kicks off a single message to a single person. So we'll talk about behavioral marketing and, and you'll see I think that a lot of times these what you would think would be advanced concepts can manifest themselves in, in very logical, very compelling uh, program types. So we'll talk again in just a minute about the uh, about the birthday campaigns. So I'm going to break this up into kind of four pieces and, and four core areas that, that we see our customers and good marketers kind of embracing with the email channel. And from here on out, we'll, uh, we'll keep it very kind of creative-based and, and real-life campaigns. Okay, hang on one second. Well, this would be the part where I would be showing you a Dunkin' Donuts confirmation slide. Dave, I think you might have just passed it. It might be just one slide back. Okay, I, okay so I've got a refresh issue because I'm still on the, ah, there we go. Okay, now I guess I should give it one second. There we go. We had a little bit of lag there. And is that now the confirmation screen, Eric? Yes, that's it. Perfect. Sorry, a little bit of a uh, little bit of internet latency there. I was still looking at the interim slide. Okay, great. So let's jump into some of the examples uh, that we will show you that are are our customers. So one of the most core kind of behavioral type programs is simply a confirmation email, uh, right? In this specific case, it's a contest uh, thank you. So someone signed up for a contest, uh, and when they signed up, there was this confirmation email that provided kind of the second layer of information 
you know, in order to get the maximum amount of people to sign up, uh, you can imagine this was on a banner with, you know, all across the internet with five or seven words on it in order to get people there quickly. Uh, this describes the kind of rest of the program. You see the recommendation to not forget the leaderboard so you can stay in touch. Um, and it provides the ability to deliver a link to the official rules, which is part of the kind of way to do a contest uh, nicely and legally. So it, it serves a lot of purposes beyond just that kind of very quick interaction. But it, it lets the customer know that, uh, that you are there and that you're responding quickly to them. This is an example from, and, and this may be, uh, this is a larger scale business, I think, than, uh, than most people would, would have the, the kind of general view of. But this is Air New Zealand. So they're a customer of ours. And I show you this for the reason that, um, this is a great example of how uh, a very large brand has realized that they can't just kind of communicate in a, in a very corporate way. And it's something I think a lot of small businesses understand, but it's always kind of surprising to see large businesses understand. So this is an email that goes out uh, two days before a flight. And Air New Zealand can do this. They've got a, a limited flight schedule between Auckland and uh, London. So what they do is they send this email out. You see the document on the right has all the traditional stuff that would be in an email, right? It would be, you know, weather and your flight details and tips and everything. But what they've done is this is actually Helen Dusnap is actually the flight service manager on that flight that this passenger will be on in two days. So what they've done is they've kind of gone the extra mile to say to include a, a personalized note from Helen her picture and, you know, a, a very kind of in-person experience. So they actually tell us all the time that they have folks getting on airplanes uh, with these printed out because it actually, you know, it, it insinuates that Helen is the flight service manager on the flight at the bottom there. And literally people print this out and bring it along with them. So I, I show this to everybody in the sense that what we know as small business people is you know, our ability to interact with people one-on-one -on -one in a very personalized way is something that absolutely should flow through into your email marketing, uh, even when you move to a little bit larger scale. So you've heard me talk a couple of times and mention the Happy Birthday campaign. So this is a campaign that actually a lot of mid- and large-sized companies still struggle to kind of get a handle on. Uh, there's a lot of debate about, you know, if you're a large company, what kind of offer do you provide or how do you, how do you gather the birthday data to begin with? Um, there are lots of kind of open-ended questions, but this is, uh, think about it, if we all put ourselves in the mindset of an email recipient, um, you know, we all know that there are one or two or three brands out there that kind of under know what our birthday is and we're kind of pleased to get an email from them during that month and whether they just say happy birthday or whether they you know, deliver a set of bonus points here like you see Disney doing or in some cases uh, a lot of retailers will offer a discount or some kind of offer or a coupon uh, you know what you kind of deliver in this campaign isn't as much uh, as important as actually just delivering it. So this is a great example of a program that uh, we would work with our customers and, and they would set it up and you know you see there we believe that you deliver it kind of the Monday before the customer's birthday. So it's a program that runs all the time and is looking at the data and every Monday the program wakes up and looks at everyone in the database and says who has a birthday for the next six days and sends, a, sends them this email personalized to them. You see the white box there in the middle. Um, that's actually a, a placeholder for, you see reference that special birthday code. So they're actually integrating an individual birthday code so that they would understand who redeemed it. So this is a great example of a very simple communication 
that you know would involve you setting it up once and ensuring that you had the right data and had a good way to uh, to collect birth date, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, there's lots of ways to do that, either uh, in person or via Facebook. Facebook is probably a little a um, little more preferred way to do that. So we'll talk a, a bit more in a second about that. But the key is really having a campaign that recognizes your customers in a way that your competitors and the majority of people that they do business with uh, won't go there. Here's another example. Uh, this is uh, this may be relevant for a lot of small business owners who have uh, you know a salesperson who sells to the channel. So we have a company in Australia, it's Heinz. I'm sure everybody knows Heinz Ketchup. Um, so they have channel folks, uh, sales reps who stock their grocery stores, and all their new product information. They were communicating by email every six to eight weeks to their grocery store folks, and instead of they weren't re wasn't really resonating. The the details weren't getting all the way into the channel. Uh, you know, executives would show up in the channel and find that it wasn't merchandised correctly or you know, whatever communication had broken down, uh, either with that email that was, you know, every month and a half or two months, or with the actual salesperson. So they actually reduced the cycle time to uh, about every week or every other week, and freed up the salesperson from having the burden of communicating all these changes and new products and everything to the grocery store managers, and found an increase in a huge increase in relevant business dialogue on the sales reps part now so that he when they went into retail they didn't have to talk about seven things with a retailer they literally could just talk about very very salient things and the open rate for those uh, emails was you know two or three times what your average open rate would be because all the grocery store folks knew that it was an important communication from Heinz about a new product so uh, for those of you who are in, you know, small business segments where you've got uh, one or two salespeople in the field, email marketing, you know, it doesn't always have to be commercial and selling and product or service in nature. It can be incredibly supportive of a, you know, one or two salesperson type function. Talk for a minute. Uh, another type of program, as it were, is a welcome message. So I've got a couple of slides here from one of our customers called Tafford, and they do scrubs. So they sell uh, scrubs to nurses and and to hospitals all over. So they employ a simple welcome message uh, that when someone signs up at their e-commerce website. Uh, this email pops out to them. It's incredibly clear. It gives them the highlights about what they can expect from this channel. And it doesn't really matter where folks sign up, so they'll receive this same, this same email. And the folks at Tafford have told us that this triggered email that is, you know, immediately upon sign up outperforms their kind of once a month uh, broadcast newsletter at a pace of about 38 to 1 as it relates to opens and clicks. So again, the, I think the important lesson here is there are simple campaigns that we all can kind of wrap our heads around that you, know, you don't have to be an expert marketer or figure out this really complex thing. It makes sense that if someone comes to your website and signs up that it would be nice to send them a welcome message and set some expectation for uh, for what you'll do with the channel. One of the other things that Tafford does, um, they choose to do it, and there's a fair amount of debate uh, depending on what size retailer you are and what your what your specific business is. Tafford actually does the morning after, so they'll deliver this ten dollar off coupon, and the great thing is again you can use the uh, one single promotional code like they have here. So, you know, May 11 off. 
Uh, for a little bit more complex marketers, you might provide a an individualized code there so that you can understand on a specific basis how many people um, redeemed that code. But this gives them a great way to measure a new sign up and to understand whether a $10 off coupon and free shipping is a compelling driver for a brand new site visitor. So again, they show, uh, they report about a 10 to 1 uptick uh, on this versus their broadcast messaging. So let's talk about growing your audience. Um, those are examples of triggered campaigns um, to people that are already in your database. There are certainly with good email marketing, uh, there are lots of ways to grow your audience. So one of the ways uh, when we talk about the Facebook uh, forms and, and the birthday program, one of the ways that is potentially one of the least obtrusive ways to gather a fair amount of information from someone is if you have a form on your website or any other place on the internet, um, our platform includes the ability to provide this one-click sign-up that you see across the top. In this specific case, you see LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, we support about 20 different networks, including Google and Twitter and Salesforce and all kinds of uh, different iterations from multiple uh, multiple industry segments. And what those do is we have about, as you see there, 66% of users prefer to use their social sign-in. So what they would do is use that as opposed to filling out the form below. So instead of creating name and company name and all those kinds of things, it's particularly uh, relevant when you're asking someone to do something that requires them to set up a password or you know, some, some really deep interaction. There may be a very good reason that you want them to have access credentials to your website, but the process of filling out that entire form is very difficult. So the one-click sign-in allows them to use their social credentials to literally just log in with their Facebook username and password. The important thing is, uh, particularly with Facebook, there are an entire set of data points that come along from the Facebook profile which, by the way, includes birth date. So the minute someone uses Facebook to log into one of your forms or to request a, a quote from you or whatever the case may be, well, once you kind of gone through this form and gotten someone to raise their hand and, and use that Facebook uh, one-click sign-up, then you have their, their birth date. So now you can absolutely set up that happy birthday program, and it runs in the in the background completely. It's nothing you have to touch. And you know, if uh, John Smith here signed up today and his birthday was two weeks from now, uh, the Monday before his birthday, that campaign would simply trigger the birthday message to go to John Smith. One of the, one of the really primary places, and, and uh, this is a very popular tactic right now for small and medium business, um, one of the questions over the last 12 to 18 months that a lot of businesses have asked themselves is, how do I effectively address Facebook? What can I do on Facebook that will allow me to, you know, take it beyond just posting a bunch of promotional codes or delivering discounts or just kind of interacting with my customers? One of the core ways that uh, that a lot of our customers do is they actually have a specific page on their website. You see here, this is the new Facebook timeline format. And you see it's got these four kind of key areas. I've got the one circle to subscribe to their free, our free newsletter. This is actually the Silver Pop um, Facebook page. So folks come to the Silver, Silver Pop Facebook page, they click on that link. And what they get is a form to sign up for our newsletter. So now we're creating an opt-in. And this form is hosted by Silverpop. So this is essentially a front-end form. When someone fills this out, it writes directly to uh, the database. And everyone, uh, it goes directly in there. There's no intervention required. Uh, they're now in your database. And you've captured a lead from Facebook 
and then can market to them over time. This is a very important kind of grow your audience strategy for the Facebook channel. Another option, uh, we have a in-store email collection. So we have an app for the iPad that allows, uh, would allow you to set an iPad up in your retail location uh, without having to be set up with the network. And it would allow you to gather names and addresses and birth dates in your retail location that then you could connect to the internet later and instantaneously import them into your Silver Pop database. So uh, we have a, a museum over in London who uses this uh, with special art installations so that users can sign up for additional information around specific um, uh, artists' installs. Let's talk about increasing your interactions for a minute. So one of our one of the key questions we always get is, you know, I, email marketing. I, I don't know if it makes sense for my business. I'm a very traditional business. We're not really that savvy. Um, the folks at King Arthur Flower, they're about a hundred and eighty year old business. Uh, they were around in the days of Ben Franklin, and they make flour for really high end bakers. And they're I love them because they're a great example of a very traditional brand that has done some very cool things with the social world. So you see this is an example of an email they sent uh, that was a campaign that they do every year around Christmas and they simply ask people to upload pictures of the greatest recipes that they've made using King Arthur flour. And this is a great example of uh, embracing your audience and asking them to help you generate what's called user-generated content, which is what UGC stands for there, um, and be able to share and build a community. And you see last year they had more than 150 photos added. Another example for King Arthur Flower is when you open that dialogue with your customers and you find ways to really kind of talk to them the way they are interested in speaking with you, you see the ability to add the uh, the quotes in each one of these articles, right? So on the right-hand side, you see the quotes uh, from the users on each one of those images. And we do see huge amounts of lift in both quarters and sales uh, when you integrate that user input into email communications. Another great example is re-engagement messaging. So this is a little bit, um, a little bit advanced, but for folks who are emailing today, and understand that there is uh, some degree of interaction and you can understand how often people open things and how often they, they ignore things. You certainly over time can look at a person's propensity to open your click on your email campaigns and you can set a program to essentially get them back. So you, know, you see the one on the left says, we miss you, come back soon, 25% off, you might wait 30 days and then send another one it said, you know, what are you waiting for? 30% off, and then you know, another 30 days, uh, you know, last chance. But wow, it'd be great to have you back. And there's a, an offer there as well. And one of the classic reasons for uh, using an email email channel with uh, with any kind of e-commerce is just simple uh, upsell and cross-sell, right? So recommending. Uh, products and or services that uh, that are related to your what you're selling. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes here quickly um, on the location based topic and then I see about 11 questions in queue here so we're going to jump right into those. Let me just be clear um, this is something that a uh, company that we own is called Place Punch is our experts in this field uh, it's not necessarily integrated directly into our platform. It's kind of a standalone company, but I wanted to share some of this thinking with uh, with the audience today and give you a few things that you can go do on your own to uh, to begin to experience uh, location-based marketing. So, in general, location-based marketing is a brand new. I think we've all seen these signs by the side of the road uh, that the Department of Transportation puts up that lets you know kind of where you're at and what vendors and what companies are around you. Uh, some some of you on the phone may have actually uh, 
may have actually bought some of that space. Um, but the thing that's developed over the last probably 12 to 18 months, and you may or may not have heard of a company called Foursquare, which is kind of the market leader, and then Facebook has a function inside uh, a platform called Facebook Places. So what it allows someone to do is check in, and in essence what someone does is they pull out an app on a smartphone that is uh, GPS powered so it knows latitude and longitude, it has a whole database, and they check in at some place. Essentially they're raising their hand and saying I'm here. Most people do that uh, as a way to share some of their favorite locations. Uh, they do it for kind of social credibility. They do it because they want to be cool and you know tell everybody that they're at the you know latest hottest Mexican restaurant, whatever the case may be. Uh, Foursquare has about 25 million users now, and Facebook Places is growing rapidly inside uh, inside the Facebook enterprise. So. It's something that's a little bit new, and not everybody's going to do it, but it's an interesting place that a small business that has a traditional brick-and-mortar presence uh, can absolutely get involved with for free and uh, can begin to test some things. So you'll see here, um, the first thing you would want to do is claim your venue. So whether you're a Facebook user with the, with the mobile app on Facebook, or if you download the Foursquare application, uh, what you would do is check in to your physical location. Uh, if you don't happen to see your location in the in the list of things when you say check in, you can actually add it to the database. And then you as the retailer would, you see the thing that circled there, it says, do you manage this venue? Claim here. So you can claim that venue, and then that essentially becomes yours to manage. Once you are kind of managing that venue, then there are certain things that you're able to do with the face, Facebook or Foursquare platform. And I would say probably at this point Foursquare is a little more open and is absolutely free. So if you really want to try this, I would suggest probably Foursquare first and Facebook second. Uh, once you have folk, once you have your location set and you're managing it, then you can look for things like people who are checking in at your location. Um, you certainly can look at the number of times someone has checked in at your location. It will keep The system will keep a simple count, so you can extrapolate loyalty in some sense. Uh, Foursquare has a concept called mayor, so if someone has visited your location uh, the most amount of times and there's an algorithm behind it, um, they'll be the mayor of your location. And you probably don't want that to be you, just to be clear. You want that to be one of your customers, and you want probably a good reward for someone who is the mayor. Uh, Swarm is, I think the criteria is about 100 people in your location. So you know, if you run a small business, that's probably not something that you're ever going to get uh, get around. And then certainly you can do offers for um, folks who are brand new. So first time check-in offers, you might offer, you know, 10% off of uh, color copy or, you know, uh, a free Coke with an order. And this is uh, kind of the manifestation of a check-in special. So that's what it would look like on screen. And you can develop these specials and, for whenever anybody takes that kind of user-defined action. And once you have that action, then there is a uh, metrics panel within Foursquare that allows you, you see here, uh, the last 30 days report. It tells you how many check-ins. And this is all for free. So you can go kind of dip your toe in this water today, experiment a little bit with it. And then, uh, you know, I believe Foursquare has a set of kind of paid programs behind this. But um, if you want to kind of step into the world of what location-based marketing means, uh, certainly, you would want to pull a lot of that data over time and understand who your most relevant and most loyal customers are, and then uh, find ways to add them to your email marketing database so that you can kind of continue to nurture that relationship with them over time. So that is kind of the end of the presentation itself. You see my um, 
my Twitter handle there at Dave Walters, and see Dave Walters at so or D Walters at SilverPop.com is my email. So um, I would absolutely encourage anybody who wants to go a level deeper, um, contact me there. And it looks like we've got about 15 questions to tackle, Eric. So let's let's take a run at them. Sounds good, Dave. Great stuff. Love the uh, the real life examples there. It always gets the uh, creative juices flowing. I think no matter what size company you are, or if you're just even a you know, regular small business or a big large corporation, it's uh, it, it definitely is great stuff to see other examples. Cool deal. So I've got a question here from Bonnie, and she's asking, do I need a separate database program to run an email service provider? Ah, great question. Um, most email service providers will be kind of a uh, software as a service type program where you'll log into a system that is web based. So the majority of them will have their database uh, in, in some specific format that lives behind it. So now you should think about an email service provider as a um, as a separate system that you can import and export things in and out of, but uh, you don't need your own database. Don't there's not a lot of technical requirements behind it. Very cool. Um, Judd is asking, how often should I email my uh, my email list? Ah, the the eternal probably top one or two questions we face in the email world. Um, you know, I, I recommend most folks who are new to the channel uh, begin by aggregating a set of email addresses over time and start with a newsletter that's that's once a month and Try to calibrate your content for something that's meaningful and and people show interest in it. And then, you know, unfortunately, the the best advice I can give folks is it really depends on your customers. So if you're, you know, if you're just kind of informing folks about things happening in your business once a month, it's probably fine. Uh, if you run a, an eighty percent off sale every other Wednesday at your location from 1 to 2, uh, I absolutely would be communicating that to your folks by email. So it really depends a little bit on your business. Very cool. Melissa has asked, uh, she saw the email about the coupon, included a coupon there, which I think it was Disney, and she wants to know, like, do you need to always include a coupon for your email uh, that you're sending out? No, that's um, that's actually a source of debate with a lot of folks. Um, uh, candidly, I, I fall into the group that believes that there is great value beyond coupons. So, you know, I, I believe that there's a. It's much rarer for a company to demonstrate uh, a kind of personal touch and a caring thought uh, in an email versus just sending someone a coupon. So, you know, there are all kinds of schools of thought. Some folks have businesses that have, you know, a, a 20 or 25 percent profit margin that's set aside solely for discounting. Um, and if that's your business, then, then couponing is a great way to do it. So a little bit different for everybody. Uh, I, I tend to believe that um, if you go the extra mile to communicate with your customers in a way that differentiates you from you know your competitors or your average business that uh, that that really does set a great tone for you with your customers. Cool. I've got a question here from Juliana, and she's asking: Don't most services, ESP services like SilverPop or Mailchimp, um, use your email address? Uh, you mentioned earlier that they um, that we should not run off our email. So she's a little confused. I think she's probably referring to. You know, how does this, you know, someone using your email address inside SilverPop and how that is distributed versus from Outlook or something like that? Right. And it, yeah, exactly right. Um, think of your, think of an email service provider. You could send email from any address, like any, you know, dwalters at SilverPop.com could be a send from address from inside SilverPop. You've got to do some very specific things. Uh, I talked about our deliverability. I mean, there are very specific configuration things that you need to be able, you need to do before you send from, you know, uh, an individual's email. Um, in, some, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, email service providers will be plugged in behind addresses like feedback at silverpop.com. 
but in, in an equal number of cases, and it gets a little more complex, but a lot of folks who are involved in, uh, in very complex sales cycles have messages that would, you know, if I were a salesperson, there would be a series of messages that went out to prospects that would actually look as if it came from me, even though it didn't come out of my outlook. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Got a, uh, another question here, kind of two questions that I'm going to combine. It's one's from Maria and one's from Stephen. Um, Stephen a, a works at a law firm and, and Maria works at a real estate business. And they're talking about, you know, we talked about products here, and they're kind of saying, how do we apply this to the service industry? Um, is it any different, I guess? It, you know, it, in a lot of ways it is, um, but in some very important ways it isn't. Uh, so we actually have a ton of service businesses. Uh, when I did this internally at UPS, the primary thing that we were communicating to our customers were service outages for natural disasters. So, for example, we used it on 9-11 when, you know, the, the terrorists in New York, that shut down our ability to deliver for, you know, hundreds of miles of circumference. So there are all kinds of companies who use email as a means of customer communications. Um, you know, I think about some of the law firms, we actually have a fair amount of law firms who, who use our tool and they use it a lot in customer communications, uh, also in keeping clients informed about, you know, kind of workflow driven processes as documents are, um, are going through a system. They would have the, the Silverpop tool connected to it and when it, uh, you know, when it was cleared by one, uh, one lawyer and it was getting ready to move to the next step, it would actually email out automatically three or four people and notify them that it was moving along in the process. So uh, the channel has the ability to kind of support virtually any kind of one-to-many business need that, uh, that most small to medium businesses could come up with. Good stuff. I've got a good question here from Hector. Um, he's asking, does your email tracking system um, determine if the customer uh, has read the email based on the show pictures? I'm pro he's probably referring to yours or any ESP for that matter. Right. Yeah, there are um, the, the primary means of measurement is what's called a single pixel GIF file. So there's an, an unseen kind of one by one pixel GIF that, uh, that sends the kind of beacon back that says, you know, user X opened your email. Um, the genesis of his question is probably around uh, what happens when some of the email clients default to images off. So uh, it's kind of a developing, what we tell folks is, you know, the, the measurement of your email metrics are kind of like your measurement of your web analytics. Um, they're not absolute numbers. The way you really want to view them and manage them over time is as a trend. So, you know, some percentage of people will, you know, delete all their cookies after every session, and some percentage of people will not turn on images in their emails, and, and that kind of is just one of those internet anomalies. So. Over time, as you send campaigns, you'll get a very clear understanding for uh, what works and what doesn't, and you know, not being able to open a single pixel GIF uh, by one, ten, twenty people in your list is uh, is probably not going to significantly change your uh, your trends over time. Cool. We've got. Looks like we have time just for one last question, and I want to let everybody know that we're going to try to email answers back to all these questions. So. Um, anybody's question that wasn't answered, we'll, we'll respond back to you via email. This last question is from Edward. He's got a great one. Um, he's saying, if I change ESP providers, would my email clients uh, or my email addresses um, come with me, or must I start over again with another ESP to grow my email list? You know, that's a, that's a great question, um, and that's one we get a lot. Um, we, you'll find that there tends to be a fair amount of churn with small-ish email companies, so, you know, for folks who come through a constant contact uh, or MailChimp and come up to us, uh, you know, if you come from a, a reputable platform where we know and, you know, we're, we're going to have some, 
relatively serious conversations about how you grew your list and you know where those names come from, how they've performed in the past, because you know we offer a service that uh, that is dependent on your and our ability to manage the the reputation and the reliability. So um, by and large, if you're working with anyone who's reputable, those names should come along with you, and you should be able to export those into a list. And you know you should be able to, you know export your mailing templates in the HTML format, and there should be relatively straightforward ways to do that. Um, you know, there are, it, if you've been in the past kind of involved in things like renting lists or some of the, some of the things that are a, a smaller email service provider might not be quite so uh, insistent about, then, you know, we'll have some We'll have both some conversations and potentially uh, some ways to help you get your your data kind of cleansed and pointed in the right direction. So that's a that's a you absolutely own that data, but we want to we want to make sure that you are most successful with that data in a in a really good system. So we'll help you both from a uh, from a migration standpoint and also you know how you think about growing your list. Good stuff. Sky, just see your question too. Yes, we're going to send this out, and there's a lot of people's question here. We will be. Uh, this deck is going to be uploaded into um, SlideShare on Silver Pops. We'll include that on Silver Pops SlideShare, excuse me, and we'll include that link in the uh, follow-up email. We're out of time right now. I see a lot more questions coming in. We'll still try to get back to everybody's questions. Dave, I just want to thank you. Uh, you did a great job of great stuff. I love uh, love seeing all the the presentation, and I can't thank you enough for your time today. Thanks so much, Eric, and everybody. Yeah, yeah no do, problem. Uh, email me or uh, reach out for me on Twitter. Glad to uh, glad to help folks wherever they are in the process. Sounds good, and and thanks so much. It was uh, truly a good, good, great webinar and good content. Um, all right, everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, for attending today. As I said, we're going to send out a follow up email and we'll have a link to this webinar to the actual video of this webinar, um, and we'll also have a link to the uh, slide share with the slides. Um, and hope you had a, a great uh, experience and looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing you guys again soon in another stamps.com webinar. Thanks again to, to Dave Walters and Silverpop for a great presentation and hope everybody has a great week.